And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, get completely fucked over by OBS. <laughs> I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildred, and with me I have two of my good brothers here in the temple. On one hand, we have... The man, the man who did not launch a thousand ships, but he may launch a thousand airships. Good brother Ash. Hi. And we have the bane of my existence, the CEO of Zadaria Enterprises, and the man of a thousand runes. Good brother Xanatrix. I bet you we could make an OBS that's also 10,000% better. <laughs> well... You can't call it Zadare BS because that has other implications. No, no, no. It'd be Obi Zadare. Okay, that's better. <laughs> but it is once again that time to return to the Valley of the Judged. Last week we tackled the fighter. This week we're tackling a class that is a bit more that gets a bit more use and a bit more misuse in some cases. We are going to attack the lovable scamp known as the Rogue. Now, obviously, the, obviously the Rogue has its has its fair share of history in various forms. What with what with it being one of the one of the one of the more um, jack of all tra jack of all trades ish classes, right next right next to the Bard, depending on your edition and depending on your interpretation. Um, earlier before we went live, I had brought up how the Rogue back in 4th edition, if you knew what you're doing, you could make some, you could make some kind of attack on every single action because of the action economy that 4th edition had. So, pot so potentially, you could, you could do four attacks in a round. More damage than anybody but the wizard. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even the wizard. Um, also, there was the infamous bloody path um, ru rule, which which had to which had to get eroded uh, which had to get um, eroded out because well let let me, this was a fifteenth level daily at daily attack that you could get it caused a lot that caused a lot of stupidity because of how it was written. You move your speed. Every enemy that can make an opportunity attack against you as a result of this movement attacks itself with its opportunity attack rather than you. Any enemy that can make an opportunity attack against you during this movement must do so. It cannot refrain from making the attack to avoid harming itself. So, it's the whole... I through a crowd and everybody swinging their swords and hitting each other thematically speaking mm -hmm. man that's an old Errol Flynn yeah th I think that was the intent but once but once you um once you try and put that into non-human encounters Problems start to <laughs> reveal themselves. Y young adult dragon has to attack of opportunity itself. What? Um. Oh fuck that! How, um, imagine, imagine trying to justify this with, say, a beholder. <laughs> beholder has an attack of opportunity with all of its tentacles. <laughs> oh man, that would be a. Uh, that'd be terrible. Yeah. Um. <laughs> To the point where somebody made a short list of all. It's uh, it's one of those cases where I can I can I can understand the I can understand the intent, but it but it was unfortunately worded, and um, that's only the that's only the second most infamous case of unfortunate wording. But we'll get to that when we inevitably get to the ranger. Oh bo oh boy! When, when oh we, boy! When we get to oh boy when we get to that, but. Rogues are still a skill. Obviously, in Five E, rogues are still a skill monkey. Although oddly enough, although um, oddly enough, not as not as skill monkey as the as the bard. But 
lengthy, but I will I will say I do pr I do honestly prefer the w the way backstabs work with with the rogues in 5e versus the way they worked in say 3.x or Pathfinder. Because more often more often than because advantage is going to be e is going to be easier to pull off than just having somebody be flat-footed or fr or flanked. Mhm. Mm um and what of what of course also helps is the whole cunning action thing. Yeah. And the and as I as I pointed out before we went before we went live, the fact that in a move that would that pissed off a lot of traditionalists, the whole certain creatures are immune to sneak attacks what has been excised, and I think that I don't think that's ever coming back. And you know that that makes sense. Uh, as I said before we went live, I always felt that the reasons for sneak attacks not affecting the undead or constructs was contrived. You can, If you can sneak up on something, you're going to be able to cause more damage simply through preparation. It doesn't matter whether they have a vital point for you to stab. If you've prepared a very specific way to attack them by sneaking up on them, they're going to take more damage. Yeah. Um. And... When it com when it comes to now when it comes to the when it comes to the um the le the level up version of it there were there were a couple things that I that I felt I, I felt I wanted to note first off um I'm glad that we tackled the f we tackled the fighter last week because there's some things within this book that are re that are referencing that one of them being the um the u the use of maneuvers and since since that's now two classes that use the maneuver system, I think it's fair to say that the maneuver system is going to be um, system wide for any martial characters. I uh, I haven't taken a look ahead, so I can't uh, I can't spoil it for myself either. Mm -hmm. But I would say that's a pretty. I would say that that's probably a good guess, but I would. I'd extend it even further to say that there may be a different maneuver pool for casters. We'll we'll be able to take a look at that once we get once we get to once we get to one of the uh, casters, which probably won't be for a bit. Probably won't be for a bit, but it will ha it will happen eventually. Okay. Um. Now, when it comes now, hang now, hang. Now, when it comes to now, one of the things that is definitely a change from it from its source right at right at the right at the start is the concept of expertise dice, which expertise die has has been has been in fifth, but this particular version of it was in the um, D and D next playtest. I distinct I distinctly remember this. So this is. This is them bringing something back that they thought that even the playtest had well, and, and but wasn't included. Yeah, and now, uh, now, in core five e expertise is just du is just um doubling your pro doubling your proficiency bonus, but in this yes. case we have we have a um D we have a D four bonus, and I'm curious. I'm curious what I'm curious what your what your guys is um ta what your guys take on this particular change is. So, uh, from from my point of view, expertise as just doubling your proficiency almost didn't seem like like that much of a bonus early on. It was you'd only really see a lot of. Uh, of improvement from it as your proficiency die, your proficiency bonus went up. Um, the the expertise die seems a little bit more, I guess, balanced. It's gonna it's gonna make sure that the die remains uh, relevant mm -hmm. from level to yell level to level as your as your proficiency goes up. And uh, then you also have here a way to scale expertise die 
if you have multiple features that all grant expertise, increasing the size of the die. Mm -hmm. I, I think that scalability mechanically um, works a little bit better, but I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, Ash. I don't, honestly, I, I am very disinterested in dice mechanics by and large. And this is no exception. Um, I didn't even highlight it. It was just, this is a slightly different way of doing things. Mm. I am slightly annoyed that the expertise, because it seems as if the level of playtest is going to be making heavier use of skills. Uh, I don't particularly like the fact that it's additional dice, so I think it's going to increase resolution time slightly. Yeah, so... Heart that is That is my only concern or examination of it. It's just if I know oh, somebody's going to be rolling an extra die. And sometimes that's going to be annoying and other times I'm not going to care. That's my thoughts on it by and large. Yeah, about the same as when we saw the whole half advantage or minor advantage thing last week where instead of getting just a plus two minus two. Oh, no, that, one, that one's definitely going to slow down the game. Yeah. yeah. Is that is ever so slightly different from here, which this will on occasion slow down. Um, but okay. it's whatever. What I what I will what I will say though is, if is um, I feel like the I feel like the exp the the fo the um, the skill monkeyness of the rogue is instead um, represented through the exploration knacks. Um, so. So Rogue is also getting... So is, are, is every class getting a, an exploration pillar? Is that what this, the implication is now? Because I know that they said they, that they wanted to give an exploration pillar to fighters, but is it just all classes? It, it might be. We'll see. We'll see. We're, we've already got two that have it, and um, it looks like... It looks like, they get, looks like they get an additional one every odd-numbered level. Um... Oh, that's quite a lot. Eh. And the thing the the thing that the thing that I noticed with it is I mean obviously with the ex with their list of the exploration die, yeah, some yeah, on one hand this does tie with the whole expertise die. But I also notice noticed that that each of them ha each each of the um exploration knacks has some other effect than just getting that expertise die for for certain um, skill checks or certain tool checks. Um, I'd say the I'd say the only um, the only ex the only exception to this particular rule is stuff like extra skill training, which just get which just lets you um, well ex that and expertise training, which just lets you um, do more skill monkey. Um, like ex expertise training, you could potentially use that to scale up the die. And extra skill training, you can use that to give yourself proficiency with more skills. But like hiding the shadows, you can attempt you can attempt to hide while you're in dim light. Um, obser observer, you can bo uh, boost your passive perception. Um, agile athlete gives you a gives you a better climb speed. You know. I will always, I always prefer an a effect that ha that is not just a one, is not just a um, singular modifier. Mm. Um, I've br I brought this. I think I brought this kind of thing up when I mentioned the diff the difference between cer certain feat chains in um, fan in fantasy craft versus um, Pathfinder or D and D third. Yeah, where compared to D and D third or Pathfinder, Fantasy Crafts feet chains are basically multi branching paths. Whereas yeah. in most cases, with the with the former, it, you have to take certain strings of feats to get it effective. What what I am what I am now maybe I'm alone on this, but what I am tilting my head at is that with a lot of with a lot of the class features, it's a case of choose. You ha you very much have some some sort of exploration knack like a f like um, pattern, even though they're not in the same pool. Like for with um, innocent facade at thir at third level, 
you pick, you pick one of the options. It gives you an expertise die on a certain check and a um and another effect. Mm -hmm. Although um, I could I could see some fun ha I could see some fun being had with distraction. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you use perf use performance versus insight to make the to make the creature have disadvantage on perception and and mess with its passive perception. Um and when when it comes to the other the other thing I know the other thing I noticed and I'll have to I'll have to check if this was no, it what? No, it wasn't. It, it's not in core. Is that there? Is that they're bring? They're trying to bring in some degree of trap use for core rogues in this. That I found interesting. That I find makes sense, both flavor wise and mechanic wise. Um, now, personally, I want traps that mostly. You're be equipment and things of that sort, but I do like the idea that certain classes are, I had never believed on this thing, where somebody has a given class feature relating to a specific activity that they were therefore not allowed to take that activity if they weren't that class, unless there was a you know, there was a very specific uh, thematic or even just a mechanical justification for it, but with traps, I would like them to be equipment, but just allowing the road to say, all right, well, with the stuff that you have on you now or at any given time, you could just you could just assemble something quickly. I like that quite a bit. Yeah, I, ju I just I just look I just um, looked at core and there are no there are no now um, there might somebody might be able to pull a subclass that that focuses out of this out, out of their ass. But as far as I'm aware. Sub um subclasses notwithstanding, there is no class feature in Core Five E Rogue that is specifically um focused on tra on traps. Whereas the level up one does have that at third level with Trapsmith, where you can use not just focus on traps, the fact that you could actually produce them mm -hmm. as opposed to just evading them. Yeah. Um. I wouldn't be surprised if in the if in the full book there's fe there's feats to reduce the amount of time that it takes. So somebody who knows what they're doing could whip up a trap and say a few minutes instead of ten minutes. Um. And given and given how there given how there are certain effects that we've already seen that can mess with that can mess with um passive perception that also helps when it comes to this particular trap making um i i, I think i have one mechanically uh mechanical question re regarding trapsmith here though <clears throat> Once a creature has fallen victim to one of your traps, it can automatically spot all others? That I'm not I'm... sure that mechanically makes the most sense. I'm guessing the I'm guessing the lo the logic behind this is to make sure that players don't pull some sort of trapception thing. Well, I, I understand that, but where's the limit is i guess my my best way like if you set a pitfall trap in one room and then in a treasure room you know three rooms later you've set a trap inside a treasure box is it going to automatically spot the trap in the treasure box do you th do you think that do you think that with something like this it should it should be that um they should get a they should get a bonus to perception instead i e i e after falling for the first one it's easier for them to spot the, to spot the remaining remaining ones for for a bit i think i think a, a timed modifier of you know oh they've hit a trap they understand now that they have to look for traps and they've already seen the mechanics of one trap so maybe they'll be slightly more advantageous while looking for other traps that you specifically have made uh until you know such time as i know we hate it but until next long rest or whatever I think there's there's one of there 
I don't think you went far enough when it came when it came to that issue because there's one thing that I just realized might be might be an issue as well. And that is tra that is setting setting up traps that are of, that are of multiple um, sources. And s arcane trickster is a thing, so it's re it would be reasonable to assume that somebody might you utilize magic with their trap making. So mm -hmm. Let's say that they have one trap that's a sta that's a standard bear trap and one other that's some sort of runic that has some sort of runic trigger. Not out. Of, I'm put. I'm pushing this a little bit, but it's not out. It's not out of the realm of possibility. So, Especially if you're playing an arcane trickster. If so, this so this whole this whole granting them immunity to the other tr to the other traps if they trigger the bear trap. Why would that grant them immunity to the magic based trap when they are not going to ha when there's nothing mechanically mechanically that they'd have in common? And when I say mechanically, I mean the mechanism of the trigger. Ones they doesn't render them immune to it; it just allows them to spot it. And these are two different things. And I personally would I see what they're going for. Uh, I would axe this particular statement, and if I had to justify it. I would set it in a specific radius. Just say, so just it's just simula simulating the idea that once one person has got, fallen into a trap, they are now so on guard that they are going to that anything is going to set them off, so to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah, but if That's just what it's attempting to simulate. Which there's any number of mechanical ways to do that. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to do. A colossal amount of damage. Good dude. Good amount. Yeah. Well, and and then I'm I'm thinking a monk, uh, monk's example just here. <clears throat> if you're using a magical trap, it doesn't have an obvious trigger. Um, so even if even if they hit a mechanical trap, and now they're on guard and they can see the triggers for other mechanical traps, they're still not going to see the the triggers for the magical traps, and that's. That's a, no again. magical traps have pretty clear, and this is this is delineated throughout fifth edition is the idea that they're almost un invisible, but they're not completely invisible. If you go through and you if you know what to look for, so to speak, you're going to you're going to spot them, and you could actually see through them whatever magical cloaking there might be. I I, I understand that. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that. You've you've hit a mechanical trap trigger. You're looking for trap triggers within that same grouping. There's no, another... you're looking for anything that would set you off as to freak you out. Yeah, because the the flavor is you have now been set into a panic or a fit of anxiety mm -hmm. or a, you know a fit of your nerves are on high alert in some capacity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's just that, for the purpose of examining traps, we're going to include this little caveat here that this is the specific effect on your other traps. Like I said, I would just ask this. Um, yeah. There is one, especially since It's going to be too other... confusing. Nobody's going to get the right uh, interpretation of it. And in order to get the right interpretation of it, you're either going to have to spend like another 500 words, just introduce some other general mechanic. Mm -hmm. So might as well get rid of it. Yeah, ultimately, that's that's my my ultimate uh, decision here was it just doesn't make sense. <clears throat> there's one other from... um, there's one other scenario that I that I have you that I have used as a DM, and this is gonna this is gonna be a very me thing <laughs> when you, when you hear it. But I ha I have I have set up um tr set set up traps in certain rooms that were blatantly designed to be um fakes you know a a area that a area where there's multiple traps but one of them is a is a trap that lit, that literally does nothing specific specifically to bait out people who were overly paranoid yeah a tra a, a, a false trap mm -hmm. yeah i mean is it a is it a dick move? Sometimes they'd even be full dickish and use the and use the fake trap as the trigger for the real trap. I mean, you know, some big bad evil guys are more dicks than other big bad evil guys. So, well, I f I figure a, I figure a sufficiently paranoid noble would would 
would fi would figure that some sort of some somebody would hire a thief to to um, overcome the traps in their mansion, so they'd put up traps specifically as bait to catch other yeah to catch the the trap finders with a trap that is a trap and a trap. You know? Yeah. If I had a if my soundboard worked, this is where I'd play the Inception horn, but you get the idea. And ultim ultimately, yeah, I, when it comes to that whole immunity thing, I'd have I'd have that scratched out simply because with the way that it's written, there's too much of a possibility that players w that players and GMs would get a little overcautious with this kind of thing and not utilize it to its full extent. Or you'd end up with a lot of uh players and GMs going head-to-head -head about what it means by automatically spot others. Oh, come on! It's been two weeks since we encountered that guy. Doesn't matter. He already saw one of your traps. Yeah. This is... It's not... The trap smith is not, is not a bad feature. It's just one that needs to be eroded. Um, this thing is that one area to be cleaned up, and then it's, it's good to go. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, just that one facet, and then it'll be fine. Now, when it when it comes to when it comes to some of the cho some of the choose one of the following options, I've noticed that they fall into one of two categories. Either a, it's a set it's a set of options that are that are based on um some they're based on some sort of social effect, or b, it's almost like almost like a light version of the fighter's um fighting style feature in a, in two cases. Um. One of the one of them being combat tactic that you get at second level, and the other and the other one is defense style that you get at seventh. And something that something that I do find interesting, and I prop I probably would go further with this, is that with both of them it says each time you gain a level you can change this choice. Um, I wonder if I wonder if instead they should have the option to be able to um. Switch, but be switch between these particular tactics um, during um, long rests, either sh during short or long rests. I, I can say, I can safely say, I might consider homebrewing it. Homebrewing that. Um. So. I can. I can see advantages and disadvantages to both setups, um, both from a mechanical and fluff standpoint, uh, especially depending on the type of game you're playing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes long rests come pretty often, and uh, being able to change your tactic, knowing you know, you're know you heading towards a specific... For example, you're heading towards a, uh, maybe a, um, a cave. You know you guys are going to be going into a cave to adventure through it. Uh, using combat tactic, uh, you might decide to use Ambusher. Caves have very low light conditions and lots of places to hide, so you know, being hidden from a creature at the beginning of your turn isn't going to be as hard as it would be out in open plains. Um, being able to do that during long rests, especially if the cave is you know, a week away, uh, you're, you're going to be able to go from, let's say you started with Carver, and that's going to be a little... Well, it's not true min maxi type uh, munchkinning. It's still a little, a little bit of a gamification, and, you know, that's always going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but then changing every level also means that it changes a lot less often. Maybe locking you into your chosen your chosen uh, type until the point that you, got, that you go, hmm, I just really don't like how this type, this type of combat synergizes, so I want to try a new one. Um... I'm not sure where I'd go with this mechanically, to be honest. Yeah. Um, although I do, I the the um the rogue is al has always been known as the as the get out of, get out of the way instead of tank instead of tank it combatant. So, ha so having having those particular um, combat style like features is definitely a welcome addition. Especially since, because of that, you can you can do 
is this, let's see. So for defense now, you have three, and for combat tactic, you also have three. So a three, so a three on three um, setup. You can have a good, you can have a good variety of combat styles from that combination. Defense style gives you uncanny dodge. The evasion type is outright uncanny dodge. Yeah. Or uh, improved uncanny dodge, or whatever you want to call it. Because mm -hmm. they have an uncanny dodge here, where anytime you're hit by an attacker that you can see, you can use your reaction to have damage. Yeah. But the original uncanny dodge was deck saving throws that would normally deal half, deal none. That's covered under evasion. Yes, and that's why I said uh, evasion straight up gives you the original uncanny dodge. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> And although although between the th between the three, um, the one that I could see really getting the mo really getting the most use is Artful Dodger. Dodge as a bonus action. Oh yeah. Especially since um, ro especially since rogues more more often than not are again are are go are going to have an o are going to have an open hand. Um, Possibly, it depends on the road. Yeah. All these are probably going to get a decent amount of play, which is why letting people switch it out on occasion, such as when they level up, is probably a good idea. Mm -hmm. Allow people to play around, play around with things. It. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um. Um. I, I, I... I don't think any of us has an objection to letting players switch it up. No. It's just to the frequency yeah. uh, is, is, is what's under consideration. Mm -hmm. It depends. It depends. I I am loath to just have like a, a specific character just swap around between 20 different things at any given time. They generally speaking, like there to be permanent consequences and permanent actions and stuff like that. But then again, I also prefer to have multiple characters, and that seems to fit that particular play style better. Um. Now, when I speaking speaking of speaking of that whole choices thing, given what given what you said, what's your what's your take on the on the fact that you can do one from you can do one from the list when trap making with improved trap smith. I'm sorry, what? What's what's your take on the whole on the whole one from the list attitude of improved trap smith given what you just said? I don't I don't understand what you mean. Um you had you had mentioned how you had mentioned how you how you don't like people you uh, you're not a big you're not a fan of of people of people switching a bunch of stuff stuff out constantly. Mm hmm And and then with improved trap smith, unlike some of the other, unlike some of the others, where it's a case of here's here's a list, pick pick which one you're going to use. You have a case of every time you're making a trap, pick one of these and you can add it to your trap. Yeah, that's fine. I don't. Yeah. I don't understand the connection there. I think. I think it's. I think it's more of the of the issue of of man of managing several degrees of several degrees of options. At least. At least that's how I'm seeing it. Um, well, let me let me try to draw a connection. Oh, so because improved trap smith has a number of different potential outcomes, you think that uh, translates to no? What I, when I'm talking about somebody switching out improved trap smith for something like a spell casting ability, mm -hmm. and then doing that from level to level, or switching out improved trap smith for uh, I don't know barbarian rage Although or whatever. That's that's the thing I have an issue with not having. Uh, not the class feature itself giving you options. Guessing you're not a fan of multi-classing. I'm a huge fan of multi-classing. Just not constantly switching. Right, fair enough. It, it, the thing I mentioned was somebody taking something like a defense style, which is slightly more emblematic of an embodied set of instincts or practice 
or training or whatever have you, which is emblematic of a longer span of time having an impact on your character. Mm -hmm. Which is why switching it when you level is perfect. Because that's what leveling had... represents. Yeah, you, you're consolidating all of your all of your uh, <clears throat> learned time. Yeah, your your lower experience with a lower KC into yep. an event. Oh, yeah. Right. I can I can I can certainly make sense out of that. Um, yeah. And and like I said, it depending on the, on the game, the frequency of changing from evasion to uncanny dodge to art to our Artful Dodger, or the case of changing from Ambusher to Carver to Sniper during long rests, um, you, you, that could happen very frequently depending on the campaign, and that's just... It also... No, that doesn't matter as much from a design perspective. That's already a count. Like, spells already... Prepared spells already work that way. <laughs> Yeah, it's just but... a facet. It's just a facet of the class. It's like some people are meant to be more utility focused or meant to be more variable, mm -hmm. so they get to switch certain options out at a given at yeah. a shorter time interval. Well, it, but um, using using your example of of one is one with the with the spell with switching out spells. You're you're choosing from a list of of things you've ostensibly already got in your spellbook. If we're going with wizard, if we're going with wizard, sure. Yeah, I, I'm just going to use wizards for simplicity's sake. Um, whereas, as you pointed out, with say the defense styles, that's something that you've learned or otherwise trained in, um, to actually make your body have those particular, uh movements and, and reflexes. Uh, while no less strenuous to train in magic than in in, in physical arts, uh, a spellbook uh, is sort of a shortcut. You've got the spell right there. You just need to memorize it and hold it. What, what your training does is increase your slots and the, uh, the strength of the types of spells that you can use. And so being able to switch those out at, at long rest is you opening your spell book going, you know, these spells really didn't do anything for me today. Maybe maybe I could use these spells over here in, on this page of my spell book. <clears throat> Whereas being being a, 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 a rogue that's using Artful Dodger um, would need to practice a lot more to move to, say, evasion. Not necessarily. Um, it's, it's just that that is that is the fantasy that's being fulfilled, and I think that switching things out at a given level is just is just a design concession to like ah uh, somebody might have picked the wrong thing. Okay. In any case, yeah. Now, when it, the other th the other thing that I did that I did know that I did notice and wanted to c wanted to cover is because because uh, I can see this I can see this going multiple ways the the um the rogue has access to maneuvers but they have but they have to pick from t from two martial traditions at at once they started um second level. Those traditions being biting Zephyr, Mist and Shade, or rap or Rapid Current. There's the return of Mist and Shade that you loved so much there, Ash. You you said you wondered how it would work with a rogue. Well, it's right there now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. I mean, Mist. Is there <laughs> for both? I mean, obviously, dep depending on player player preference for how their rogue plays, mm -hmm. but. For flavor and fun purposes, is there really any other reason not to take Mist and Shade as a as a uh, as a rogue? Like I figure, Mist and Shade would just kind of be the gimme, and then you'd choose between either ranged attacks with Biting Zephyr or quick attacks with Rapid Current. <laughs> it, it depends. I know. I'm um. 
But what still, sli I, sleight of handing a sword out of a guy because he stabbed you with it is, <laughs> is still the best idea we've had. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I want I wanted to check this. I I wanted to check to see if the to see if um the if the other if the other if the other um class that class with maneuvers that we've covered has that has that kind of restriction and no fighters fighters can shoot fighters can um ch can choose can choose maneuvers from any tradition well and that's that's going to make sense from a from a, a both a fluff and mechanic perspective fighters are training to fight these martial traditions are something that they're they're trying to become proficient in as their primary focus Mm -hmm. uh, on how they approach combat, because it's, these martial traditions are for an approach to combat. Rogues are not focused on it. Yes, they do have combat that they're going to work with, and obviously they're going to want some martial advantage there. But rogues, <clears throat> rogues are more about getting in, getting out, and stabbing the guy where it hurts most, <laughs> where it's most effective. Um, or if they don't want to get in close just because that's way too much risk for a rogue, you know, they shoot you from afar. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so the, the restriction on maneuvers is a good idea since you already have, have your maneuver master in the fighter. Mm -hmm. And restriction on traditions makes sense because they're not training in all ways of martial proficiency they're they're training in you know ways of subterfuge and ways of 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 being in the shadows so those traditions that they have to choose from make sense yeah also it look it much like how much like how it looks like maneuvers are going to be a shared thing it looks like um it looks like knacks are going to be a shared thing because i just went back and checked on the fighter and it and it does have a knack, and as we kind of hinted at, it does have a Nax known um, list. So, I I guess I guess they are planning on go on going all in with with ha with having this exploration pillar. It's just that the fight the fighters exploration pillar with with his Nax are more about are more about being out being out in the being out in the wild and be, and being and the kind of things that you would expect in the well fighter kind of archetype and this. With the rogue, being on your guard and all that fun stuff. Yeah. With the rogue, it's I could I could easily see a rogue in this in in the level in the level up version with the proper setup making a decent um diplomancer. And and that makes sense because um fluff wise most rogues uh, tend to integrate into the back alleys, whether it's in an actual city or not. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so they've got to have at least some amount of smarts on the social side of things to be able to not offend the wrong person or stray into the wrong territory and get their sl their their throat. <laughs> um, it also, I think that that's a good thing to point out there that the uh, marked difference between the knacks because that shows that even though all classes share the exploration pillar they each have their own expertise on that pillar and so that means that, that they're always going to be relevant in yeah. some in some case or another now i don't i know i i know i've kind of talked about um feet um feats that are designed to dip into into other classes I don't see this happening as much with with exploration necks, simply because the way that the exploration necks work for um, <clears throat> work for the fighter and work for the rogue aren't exactly the same. The fighter the fighter's exploration necks don't have the um, expertise dive mechanic. That seems like exactly the sort of reason you would take a uh, a feat for it if you 
part of this other class, one an expertise die for this given skill. You know, an exploration knack would be a nice way to pick that up, especially if you wanted something extra along with it. Could you could you possibly see the a feat being written at a for, specifically for it? So, so it says you gain, you gain an, um, choose one choose one exploration knack from the from the rogues list. You gain that you gain that knack and are treated as having a, um, a D four or a D or a D two um expertise die. Oh uh, yeah. I would have to go back over the I would have to go back over the original to see if that would if the clarification that was a D four would even need to be made, but in any case, uh yes. Let, let me ch let me uh check. Yeah, all of the all of the ex there are only t there are only two um exploration knacks for the rogues that don't grant an that don't Actually, there's only one that doesn't grant an, ex an expertise die, and that's extra skill training. All the other ones either grant one or or um or boot or boost it. Right. Um. I I will I will admit that the te the um some of the tenth level options in low profile gave gave me a bit of a gave me a bit of a laugh, especially especially since, um. One of th one of them is a, is a far more team player kind of thing than we typically see from a um from a rogue, that being walk it back. Walk it back. <clears throat> you gain an expertise die on, on deception checks as a reaction when an ally would fail a deception check to lie. You add a support in detail. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got this. Uh, I I got this spear from a cave. We found out the cave was the tomb of a king later on. <laughs> 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 that just that just reminds me of a uh, some of the more campy uh rogue interactions in various movies. <laughs> um what like the what like the weapons malfunction? Hey, Han Solo counts as a rogue. <laughs> yes, like the weapons malfunction. Oh. It's I had heard I had heard eight I had heard the Discord ping, so I th so I thought, wait, did wait, did he finally show up? Nope. I like true lie though. When you're telling a lie, you can, your lies are so convincing, you half believe them yourself. You can use persuasion instead of deception. <laughs> and you get a, an expertise die on persuasion checks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, although... Although um one one other that I could one other that I could see I could see some people abusing <laughs> is that's that is that's available at sixth level is quick frisk because we all know somebody who's that kind of who's that kind of pack rat who would try and pickpocket everybody we've all we've all played an Elder Scrolls game at least once And mm -hmm. all of us have pickpocketed grenades into the pockets of uh, of bad guys in Fallout. Good old exploding pants. Oh. And admittedly, this is this is a case where I can ju where I can just. I'd say I'd say it's a little bit 
you know the issue that we had with the whole with old trap with old trap semi immunity with with trap making earlier. Quick frisk is a case where I could I can reasonably see why you'd have to wait twenty four hours to try and pull that again. Yeah, because now they're on guard against you specifically. Mm -hmm. Um. And what? But when it comes to now, when it comes to the thing, the thing is with a, with a lot of the with a lot of these effects, it's very it's very clear that some that some of them are skewing towards certain um, play types. And I would if if somebody's if somebody's running a, if somebody's running a very dungeon crawl hack and slashy kind of campaign i would actually hesitate to have them p have them pick a rogue i'm, s I'm not going to tell them they can't but i'm just going to say there's certain effects that you might not get as much use out of yeah but that's always a risk mm -hmm. running a character in in specific campaign types yeah that you're gonna you're gonna come across class features and skills that just aren't going to see as much usage because of the campaign type you're in and provided they have any mechanical hooks at all, you could just force that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Now that be that being that being said, Ash, I would like to pick your brain a bit a bit when it comes to when it comes to subclasses. Mm. This was actually my favorite part of the last <laughs> one to just listen to listen to the rationale about. Why does that subclass work or not work? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs middle. I love it. All right, same format as last time. This the last, that was also my most interesting one. Yeah, I'm. <laughs> go I've got well. I've got a sh I've got a short list of the subclasses. No, it's not. I'm not calling it roguish archetypes. Once again, if it if it looks like a duck, talks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it sure as fuck ain't a goose. Archetype is for fun. Yeah. It's to, it's for something to roll off the tongue nicely, and not just say subclass the entire time. Mm -hmm. Um, but and w once again the f once again the focus is how is how well or how not well the this particular subclass would um would wor would work with the level up version as op as opposed to the vanilla version. So. We'll start. We'll start with the tried and true thief. Thief. Uh... I thumbs in the middle. Thumbs in the middle. The thief is something that at this point I just want it to be a different class. I want it to be its own class. Originally, I like the idea of an actual skill monkey, which is not just skills taped onto a martial character. I, in particular, like the very much, and the traditionalists are to thank for this exclusively, how cool thieves were back in the day, and the fact that they, they were in some capacity based off of Cudgel the Clever, Jack of Shadows, these pseudo-mages, or pseudo psionicists or pseudo scions, I suppose I could say, that had some sort of supernatural ability whether that was magical or came from somewhere else but they weren't the best with it but they would use it in particular to just be bastards swindlers con men engage in all sorts of heists and and these activities which you don't get to see as much out of the modern edition so i'm going to give it a thumbs in the middle i don't know if there's any frankly i don't know if there's anybody at en world who remembers this era of the thief or has any particular affection for it. But as having recently read Jack of Shadows and the Cudgel Saga, it I'm in love with it. I would like to see that. Hell, I'd like to see that be its own class. I think it's more important to have that particular class than the gorilla archetype than the rogue ty typically embodies, but that's that's particular to me. Um it comes in the middle. I do know I do know that some of the people on the thir on the thirteenth age forums had had made a thief class specifically for that. Although the point of inspiration that they utilized was Garrett from from the Thief games. From who? 
Um, from, from the Garrett is the main character of the Thief video games. Ah. Mm-hmm. Uh, eh. Which was in the back of my mind because oh, the other day I was, wa- I was watching a stream of somebody suffer through the Thieves Guild mission. Which... Stop. <laughs> Please no. No more. Stop. Stop right there. I don't need to remember. Well, that's all I need to say about the benefit of paying attention to Appendix Cassette. <laughs> you stick with the stick with the superior source. Although I do, <laughs> although I do have to, I do have to ask the uh, the the obvious question of what about what about the what about the thirteenth level ability that that the thief got with 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 um five e, you know where they could u- where they could use um res- where they could use restricted magic items. Oh, that should have been like third or seventh. That should have been right at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is the only bit of the old thief that I, as far as I can tell, has really survived into the modern age. Yeah, and it, it makes me sad. Um. Okay. Next up, the cla- the class with two asses, assassin. Assassin, thumbs up. It's Marshall character. It's a guerrilla style character that's the primary focus of the thief. Or sorry, of of the rogue. I was thinking of the thief because all of the other the other two base 5e subclasses are basically along along with a, a particular archetype for monk, funnily enough, are basically just the thief having been cut up and scattered about. Uh, don't don't get, don't get me fucking started on that archetype. You already know how I feel about that. <laughs> we'll get to that eventually. Um, I do I do think that some of th- a complaint I've seen with the assassin is that it's a little bit front loaded. Like most of, like most of the good stuff comes up in its in its early features, and the, a bunch of the latter stuff is a little more specific. I'd say I'd say some of the social aspects with assassin would be better used in this system compared to the um ba- compared to core um 5e rogues. Yeah. I don't see any particular reason to disagree with that. Now, since I put since I put Chekhov's gun on the table when it comes when it came to the arcane trickster, let's go into that one. I'll give it a tentative thumbs up. Very tentative thumbs up. I'm playing with somebody in my in my current 5e party who is an arcane trickster, and they're having fun with it, which I'm happy about. But like the other... All, all the third caster classes in 5th edition have been uh, mitigated disasters. Like, oh, well, let's try to get rid of the need for multiclassing as espoused by people who do not need know why on earth you would Multi-class. Multi-classing is fantastic, it's fun, it's an element of power gaming, and has a narrative element and a mechanical element, and if your particular creation is good at eliminating what you think the need for multi-classing is, which is to say that it fills a given archetype, then it's just superior multi-classing fodder. And I can take it, I can put it with something else to make an even cooler multi-class character. Because it has not filled the actual niche as to why players multi-class. And obviously, if it doesn't perform that function well, then you don't even want to play it to begin with, because it just sucks. And that's what I hear a lot about the Eldritch Knight and the Arcane Trickster. But yeah, t- tentative thumbs up. I think these designers can maybe do... Actually, you know what? I'm going to give it a thumbs down. I don't see... It's I don't I don't know where to go with the Arcane Trickster. They have they have very little to go off of when it comes to the fifth edition. It's like you could do rogue things at range with Mage Hand. That's the primary element of the thief. Of sorry, the Arcane Trickster. Mm-hmm. And then the the higher the very high level ability, which is you get to steal spells and stuff like that, that should basically be that's another one which is like this should be right at the beginning, and it should be rolled into a thief class as opposed to some random offshoot. But again, it dep- it just depends on the source material. 
and whether or not they're clever enough to pay either pay attention to the best source material or to just come up with something cool on their own. Yeah. So it's up in the air. Um. So next we have Swashbuckler. So get a, get out your get out your Errol Flynn and Inigo Montoya <laughs> jokes. <laughs> Of which I have none, because I, I just have, but I do have a thumbs up for this particular subclass. I the swashbuckler okay. was fun to design. It was fun to work with. It's fun to play. It has a bunch of abilities. They are mostly cool and fun to work with. And the ones that are more social in origin can be easily translated to exploration acts. And some of the additional themes that you like about the, uh, the swashbuckler can be translated to exploration act. So it's just, it's a rich subclass with a lot of theme to it that can be mined for far more than it was for fifth edition. So thumbs up. Yep. Um, the, the, yeah, my, my, my Inigo Montoya was, a. Uh, I do not think that means what you think it means. <laughs> mm. Um, I'd say, I'd say, for <sighs> I'd say I'd say the I'd say when it comes to when it comes to a lot of the um feature when it comes to a lot of the maneuvers especially at higher levels for the for the uh, for the rogue I'd say swashbuckler is going is going to be a very natural fit um since you've got since you're going to have a whole lot more options than you would have in just core um Plus, plus, there's the fact that you'll be able to do. Plus, the, there's the fact that you'll have a lot more opportunity to use sneak attack. <laughs> um, mastermind. Mastermind. This is up there with the investigator and all these other weird subclasses, which are like, let's make Sherlock Holmes, and it's another example of like fifth ed the fifth edition designers taking something. It's like, well, we want a we want a character concept. Which kind of fits around this, and we have one mechanical, actual mechanical option that sort of goes in line with that. But we don't want to make it a feat for some reason, and we don't want to turn it into a prestige class or, or a class replacement feature or something like that. So, so we're going to take this one thing that we've made, I'm going to try to fill up the rest of the, of the subclass feature slots. Which things that with things that feel like they're related is another element where it's going to be okay. It depends on whether or not it depends on the source material that the devs are looking at. I will add one note though. So so thumbs thumbs down. This is this is something that probably shouldn't have existed, except as feats or or class add-ons. But I will. I'm going to add a you know a little a little footnote to. Basically all of these, because it's something that I forgot for the Arcane Trickster in particular, and might actually change my opinion of it, is the trapsmith element of the rogue. The idea that, sorry, you do know how to make traps. You do know how to use these in an improvised fashion that your that your party members do not. These that's an important mechanical hook. It's a very important mechanical hook. And there's no reason as to why these other subclasses couldn't play into it. So the Mastermind in particular could be, you know, we set up a lot of traps. We set up social traps. Who knows? Ooh, social traps are nice. Yeah, it's something that they could do. And that's something that a Sherlock Holmes character would do. But sorry, you've been outmaneuvered socially, and you might have the person just straight up surrender in that situation. <laughs> And with an arcane trickster, obviously, you know, magical traps. That's, that's so, a discussion that we sort of went over earlier, but in a different context. So, so in the end, uh, your 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 previous thumbs down are all caveated with, but if trap master mechanics hook get uh, get more implemented towards them, then maybe they'll be good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm sti I'm sticking with my thumbs down for Mastermind because it's one of those. It's just one of those stupid. Yeah. It's one of these so. stupid things that should have just been something that you could add onto another class. But Fifth Edition screwed the screwed the pooch and they decided that class features were going to be sparse and 
often boring and just, <laughs> just just screw themselves over. It's very difficult to design third party content for fifth edition when it comes to classes, surprisingly enough, or at least quality items, because you have to keep all these other things in your head related to well, people mostly just play from first to seventh level. But I can't make things too front-loaded, and I can't put too many class features in, but I want to make sure people are having fun. And the people who are looking for this sort of content, generally speaking, want more than 5th edition has to offer them, and boy, is that a low bar. But if I go too far beyond it, some people are going to get rid of it, or they're going to say that it's banned, and all this all, is just total nuisance. I don't, I don't want, I don't want to it. delve too deep on, onto this, it, in, but in the, instru- in the instance... Uh, in the instance of stuff like this, I can't I can't help but get the get a get the particular vibe that I that I think a lot of I think a lot of people at what at um on the develop on the development team were overcompensating for the amount of controversy that happened with four E. No. I think this was the influence of the OSR on them, actually. It's and saying, probably, uh-huh. probably a little of both. No, no, I really think this... I'm laying this one at the feet of, of ostensible new wave OSR designers who were mostly there to sell OSR products and things of that sort. Going over and saying, like, hey, listen, people think that they can't do stuff because they have abilities on their character sheets which say that you could do stuff. So you just take away those abilities on your character sheet, then they're going to try to improvise those things. And a lot of designers believe that lie for some reason. Uh, mostly because I don't think that they have, they've come up with language as to why that does not work. So they just kind of accept it. <laughs> All right. I, 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 see where you're, I see where you're going with that. Yeah, so that that was an OSR outgrowth because that also because that quote unquote problem also applied to third edition and three point five. Mm-hmm. Look at how much shit you get. Oh well, now players don't want to improvise actions. It's like yes, because the majority of the actions that they were going to take, going to try to improvise, assuming that they were willing to do it at your table, and there's about five different factors that need to align with each other before they do that. We're all covered by the system's core rules. And the people who were going to be creative anyway now get to take this more robust system and iterate on it a second time. Like using a Displacer Beast to, as a simultaneous gallows and a stepladder. <laughs> Once its function as the gallows has been completed. Um, yeah, so so that's that's a that's solely at the feet of the OSR and their displacement shenanigans. I remember that it was delicious. Uh, so what's up next on the subclass list? Next is inquisitive. It's fun. It's funny uh, you same deal as Sherlock. last time. Yeah, it's funny. Bullshit. You, it's funny you joked about Sherlock Holmes because that's exactly what the inquisitive is. Yeah. Oh God. So it's the same as I guess uh, the Inquisitive is a little bit more more uh Sherlock Holmes and the Mastermind is a little bit more Moriarty, but in either case it's identical. It's these are somewhat random class abilities thrown in there and then one or two which were given special attention and probably inspired the rest of the concept as it was going to be implemented in fifth edition. So thumbs down, but might make good fodder for other game mechanics. Yeah. Um, I um, I could I could see some of I could see some of its features get getting you getting getting utilized, but I think I think it would be one of those things where I'd have to I'd have to get my hands dirty. Um, Scout. Scout. Ah, yes, this one is actually. See this this one made it into fifth edition as an actual rogue, uh, because I believe, as we discussed last time, it was a it was originally a fighter archetype, and the fighter iteration of it was bad because it was just let's steal class abilities from from the rogue, and that's stupid. 
But for this one, it was like, hey, there's all these moving options and things that you get to use and uh, all, all these different abilities which were thematically in line with being a rogue. So thumbs up. Thumbs up. I think it would synergize well with some of the other maneuvers, particularly the Biting Zephyr. I think it's Biting Zephyr or whatever it is. The something Zephyr. The one for ranged attacks, yeah. Yeah, the one for primarily ranged attacks, thrown weapons, and stuff like that. That's that's going to go beautifully with it. It's it's a solid subclass. It is unique in its mechanics. It is well developed in its mechanics, and it would just be take, taken full advantage of in this particular system that the wonderful folks at EN World are developing. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, revived. Is this the Revi Mercer thing? Um, is this a UA? Do you have that? Do you have that uh, listed? Okay. Okay. Let me, let me correct myself. Revived was what it was originally. Then it was rechristened Phantom. The Phantom. Thumbs in the middle. Unless unless this is the psionic one. No. Yeah, do you have any other... Do, do you have the actual name of it? Because that's going to change my answer of it about it. Let me... Ch yeah, the revived... U the revived UA. I'm trying to... I'm trying to... Did make it into Tasha's. Does... I doesn't look doesn't look like doesn't look like it. Unless I'm unless I'm mistaken. Um cuz I assume you have the Tasha's and Xanathar's uh things list on your list. I bl I believe so. All right, if I found the phantom. Yeah, I found the phantom. Yeah, that one actually did make it in. Uh, thumbs in the middle. There's another one. Lots of rogue fight. It's it's a martial class. This one's a little bit more death themed. It's mechanics fodder. It's whatever. All right. Um. And lastly, we have the soul knife. I'll give it a thumbs up. Yeah, I'll give it a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. They're going to be. I think that I I'm relatively confident in them as for the for the sake of the uh, the cyanite, for the same reasons as I am the soul knife. I think that they're just going to be able to take advantage of different cyanic themed abilities and build a a robust subclass around that. So. Over overall, what what would you say? Are, what would you say are some of the pros and cons that you've seen that you've seen with the level up version of the rogue versus the five E version of the rogue? Looks like there's just more. There's more mechanical hooks built into the base system, and the rogue just happens to feed into those. Uh, the only thing that really interests me is the trap smith, but rogue is something that I am generally speaking. Disappointed in because, like I said, it's it's mashing these two different, very different characters together. With uh, they have some overlap. There is there is a Venn diagram, but I am losing in the process of making crafting the rogue out of a specific overlap in the Venn diagram between gorilla and thief. Most of the other stuff is lost, and it's often the coolest stuff. But beyond that, I mean, this is just well designed. So it's it's something which I am, I am personally not as happy about because, like I said, I have this attachment to one of these two character concepts that gets smashed together in order to actually create the rogue. But everything seems internally consistent. Everything seems like it seems like it takes advantage of the system. So they are checking off, even if I'm not particularly excited about it. They are crossing their T's and dotting their I's in regards to design. And people who enjoy rogues, this is probably the most important thing writ large for the for the five E player base. 
people who enjoy rogues will enjoy this. I'm fairly confident in that. Which, which that certainly makes sense. Um, oh, I f I forget. I completely f I completely forgot about that one that Merle's threw in in one of his streams. Acrobat. I think that might have actually made it in. Is the funny thing. <laughs> I didn't hear a lot about the Xanathar's ones. But uh, Acrobat, I'm, I'm going to give that one a thumbs up. That was that was actually really cool. That was another one where it was like, ah, this is these are cast off abilities that should have been part of the thief. It's like, hey, provided you can, I actually stole some of those abilities from Lords of Brachus. It's like, hey, provided you're close enough to X Y Z, you could you get a fly speed. I'd say there's definitely a case of mo of j of simply more with with this. It does the way you've talked about it earlier. It does sound like the the main con the main contention that you ha that one of the main contentions you had aside from that whole thief rogue thing I idea was having expertise having expertise be a die instead of instead of a modifier. No, that was the one I did not care about. Um. He didn't care one way or the other because in in some cases it can extend resolution and in others it can be fine. Yeah, and and otherwise I just generally speaking hate talking about dice mechanics unless they have something something very interesting tied within them for which the dice mechanic is actually in some capacity meaningful to that. Personally, I I have when it comes to the arguments about dice about dice mechanics, I. I have I have I have no dog in that fight. My the the thing that I have a dog in the fight of is um implementation. Yeah, that's mostly the dice mechanic thing. Um well, I've I've seen like when I remember I remember get, I remember getting getting in some getting arguments about what's about what setup has the better bell curve and I'm like that's that's for that's forest for the trees because that's only one that's only one part of the experience. But I would I would say that there is, that when it comes when it comes to the balancing act between between the between the th between the skill end end of thief and the combative end of rogue, I'd say um. I feel like that. I feel like the level up version is trying to is trying to bring in some el some elements of the thief in the tra in the traditional sense, not in the subclass sense, mind you. Although who, although who knows? Maybe at higher levels they actually do bring in that bro that <laughs> ridic that ridiculous ass ability. It's yeah. It, it's not in. It's not in this. The the thief, like the classic thief, is not in this. Unless you consider Garrett to be the classic thief, in which case I can't help you. Um, I can, like I, can almost, I could almost hear the you poor wretched crippled souls using the wrong source material. Yes. I mean, it's not like there's not modern... <laughs> yes. Yes. Let's meditate on that for a moment. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's not like there, there are modern sources that you could use, which are, funnily enough, in line with that. You could use a Corvo Atano is, is not far off of the... Not so far off of the original source material that he fits into a separate archetype. He's still quite close to it. And it's it's delightful. Mm, I don't know about using Corvo. Why not? Corvo's more of a mystic assassin than anything. Yeah. That's that's what the He's a little bit more martial. A little bit more martial, but so is Jack of Shadows. Oh. In that case, he has more overlap with Jack of Shadows uh, than he does with Cudgel the Clever. Cudgel the Clever is a little bit more, leans a little bit towards the magical end, and leans a little bit more towards the activities of like just taking magic 
and and using it however way he whatever way he possibly can. There there was a reason the reason why there was a reason why I brought up get brought up Garrett in the sense that you can be Marshall with with Garrett, but it is very not advisable. <laughs> it is it is be- if you it, if you get Marshall with Garrett, the mission has gone wrong. And if the mission has gone wrong, you are very likely to die. Yeah. That that that's how Garrett works. Right. You want to be sneaky sneaky, you want to get around things. Maybe maybe once in a while you have to knock a dude out. Yeah, the, the, the problem is that does not an appendix and thief make. That's that's where I draw the line there. It's that's somebody who's pretty good at sneaking around. Garrett would be an excellent henchman. No. Or somebody like a Corvo Tano or a Cousin of Clever Jack of Shadows. Of course he would be. But he's not a player character. That's get that's getting into the that's getting into the sh- should and shouldn't and I you already know how I feel about that kind of approach. Where um, where's that getting into? Like let's let's have this discussion because this is the most interesting thing we've talked about. <laughs> right. he, he's where does that? He's he's doesn't have enough meat on his bone for uh, PC. He's just person who uses some of these other weapons and stuff like that. Uh, pretty good at hiding. It's the 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 whole the whole. It's more it's more the idea of. From. For me, I I feel I feel like good I feel like good does um, I end up coming I end up coming back to, map design in some of the games that some of the games that I that I played, um growing up where, the ideal the ideal kind of map design is is maps that can maintain in maintain interest. When played, when played multiple times over, it's more of it's more of having a not a not full variety, but a umbrella of it. And I am fully aware that that English is not being my language of choice tonight. <laughs> but I it's I'm not I'm not I'm not saying I'm 100% opposed to it, but it's one of those things where I need to get I need to give it some meditation. Well, opposed to what? Um, the idea of the idea of having of having a character like Garrett be a um, be a be a henchman. Um, but... Let's go down the list of his abilities. He primarily uses equipment, and he's good at hiding. And as far as I'm concerned, that is not a player character. That is a good henchman because a henchman, if you relegate that to the role of henchman. It's this is a person who is reliable when you put them in these specific situations and easy to manage and they have one thing in particular that they're good at. So Garrett fits if like if I was using strongholds and followers, Garrett fits right in on whatever the ro whatever the probably the assassin or the thief uh retainer for strongholds and followers would be. Yeah. Oh, when you look at somebody like Corvo Tano, there's this wide spread of different features, which are nonetheless still thematic. It's this person who is an infiltrator of sorts. They're able to move places unseen where people can't find them. And they have some measure of supernatural skill that feeds into feeds has a direct feedback loop with everything else that they're using. Uh, ditto for Cudgel. So oh, he again, he's mostly just touring all of the uh, all of the different magical items of the thing, constantly using them and having them discarded and fail on them. And then you have Jack of Shadows, who is again they're magically accomplished, it also able to, which is also funnily enough considered separately from his abilities as a thief, where he's able to do things like slip into shadow and slip out of it. Um, I'd like to point out that Garrett actually has more skills than you're giving him credit for. Mm-hmm. Um, as of uh, <clears throat> as of Deadly Shadows, uh, he gained the ability to scale sheer surfaces, um, and he gained magic. Oh well, there we go. 
Like, he got tele- uh, telepathy to read the minds of enforcers. He got uh, the ability to destroy specific glyph statues with magic that could only be used to destroy those statues, mm-hmm. which are essentially um, mobs made specifically just to locate and kill him. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, he received the ability to destroy uh, specific, I guess, uh, specific obstacles using magic as well. He, he, he gained a lot of different things in Deadly Shadows. Um, yeah, but if I started putting those into a thematic set, most of those are going to fall into... I get the Metroidvania power up that allows me to progress in this other area. And Sam is the main other obstacle. <laughs> if you compare that to, again, Corvo Katano, it's like, no, nah, it's just dynamic. And, and again, because we're discussing games, uh, Dishonored was made more recently than the some of the thief, ga- thief games that we're referencing here. So it's not a totally fair one-to-one comparison. I'm not trying to intentionally yeah. pigeonhole Garrett. It's just... Yeah. I know. Deadly, Garrett as I primarily shadows. understand him, which is this set of abilities, this set of equipment, and stuff like that. The The ability to climb sheer surfaces, honestly, was the most compelling out of those. Because that is something where you go, oh, normal people can't do that. But, he, also, he also gets the ability to pass through um, what are they called? Keeper arches or something like that, which are which only the people with the magic can pass through. So again, normal people can't do it. Right. But yeah. you told me, like, Garrick can pass through walls, and he yeah. can just by Walking by standard. Wall using the Keeper Glyph is what it is. Right. Now, is that relegated to, like, specific areas, much how, like, in the, the very latest Thief, you could only use I'd your I'd rather your not talk about bow. that one. Yeah. <laughs> the reboot that doesn't exist? What are you talking about? Yeah. I can only use my rope shot bow on these very specifically colored planks. Are somewhat difficult to tell her from the rest, as so, opposed to just being able to pop it. It's, but yeah, it's, so it's it's difficult to it's difficult to to bring up to bring up that specificity when it comes to Deadly Shadows because Deadly Shadows is um it ha- it ha- it's jank. Um, Mandalore has called it Thief Invisible War because they have a lot of the same problems of having people try and design for both the PC and the Xbox. And and because of and the game is very consistently inconsistent regarding regarding what you, regarding what you can move on. Right, which is why I don't like using it. It's it's why I take the lowest common denominator, whatever Garrett is, is because the the games themselves are Simple. they have their own problems insofar as what they can actually support games are meant to be very simple um right but with but with that with that said with a, with a lot of the stuff that w- that was brought up um i know i've i know i've mentioned this kind of thing many times over the years but a lot of it a lot of it comes down to the in, the inability to nail down what sort what sort of fantasy you're dealing with like with some, with with something like thief with something like dishonored you know what kind of fantasy you're dealing with Mm-hmm. Um, thief is 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 mid is medieval with ti- with tiny elements of um of mecha- of mechanical aspects. Less less tiny less tiny when it comes to the metal age. Um, <laughs> but that but that's another story. Right. And dis and um dishonored is very. Um, it's Lovecraftian. Gas- the outsider is outright an eldritch abomination. Love, Lovecraft and Gaslamp is yeah. how is how I describe something like Dishonored. But with both of those, you more or less know what type of fantasy you're dealing with. Whereas D and D has consistently had the problem of, okay, what sort of fantasy are you? Well, we're all fantasies, right? Fuck off. <laughs> Which is why I'm perfectly happy to just go. It's like, oh, sorry, you're in the world of Vance now. And Morcox, uh, Lords of Chaos, are fighting over there. 
and your illusionist just came out of the land of shadows of Selosny. Yeah. I'm, I'm perfectly, which is what Gary did to begin with. And God bless him for it. I'm very disinterested in like, well, the GM setting and stuff like that. It's like, no, 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 no. This is the game. And if you feel the need to design a different game or find a different game or I don't particularly like GMs fiddling with it. I, I'm I'm less opposed to it now as time goes on and stuff like that because I understand the light. Oh, well, certain GMs, they can just base, like, we're adjusting certain things to produce a game which is distinct from the game that is produced by these by the system. But, but yeah. And I, I'm happy to go in and say, nope, this is the thief. Because you're playing in, and assuming by default, yeah, you're playing in this Vancian world. Uh, you're playing in the Dying Earth, and the Shadows off to the left of you, and Gods of Chaos off to the right. I still don't like Vancian magic. I love Vancian magic. I, uh, I, ab I absolutely adore it. It's, it's so evocative and refreshing from, you know, what, what is more or less like Avatar- or, or not even Avatar, just like in 5th edition, ah, I'm, I'm just going to keep casting my cantrips all day and stuff like that. I'm like, ah, eh, that's, that's a little boring. Well, no, I, I agree there needs to be a resource system in place. I just don't like the fancy and resource system. Hmm. You want, you want to know what I will we'll continually find? To that once we get to the wizard and stuff. Um, which, as, as an aside, do you remember, you remember when we um, when we did the reconstruction thing and we basically buried the concentration um, rule? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I've been reading through Spheres of Power for the last few weeks, and several s several spheres have an augment effect of you can maintain you can maintain this effect without having to without having to use concentration. So it looks like we're not the only ones who hate that. No, so uh, I mean, there's a reason why it's absent so, from so many different games. Mm -hmm. But, but we'll of, we'll of course be we'll of course be back here next next week with an, with the with the follow up play test and well, it's not going to be the wizard, but we will be we will be addressing our first casting class oh, at last. Um. Uh, as some closing thoughts regarding this rogue plague test, um, since I was rather non-vocal during the entire subclass thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I said, I like I like listening to you to to you uh, your reasoning, Ash. But uh, with with this, um, we can see that they felt better augmenting what rogue already had rather than rebuilding entirely. Um, which is what they did with the fighter. That's why the fighter's document was double the length of this. Um, there's there's a lot of things here that were something rogues may have already had access to that they then made more direct. Mm -hmm. And uh, personally, I really like just again as with the fighter, a lot of the stuff that they added are are both mechanical hooks and flavor addition, and. From the standpoint of somebody who would be using this, that's fantastic. I like having flavor as well as mechanics because having one without the other on either side feels a little bit hollow. So I'm, I'm really liking where uh, this level up project has gone. Um, Ian World has had some great ideas, I think, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping to see more like this. I really want to see how everything resolves with our caster next week. That'd be fun. Yeah. That'd be fun. I agree with everything you say. I, th I think the phrasing it as we just took the things that the rogue was doing already and we just gave them more of that. I think that's, I think that's a fitting explanation for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But with, the, but with all that said, that is get, that is going to do it for this particular edition of, of the Valley of the Judged. Like I said, we'll be back here. We'll be back here next week, and we'll probably we'll probably find new and interesting things to to vehemently disagree with each other about. <laughs> but until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra, 
I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.